I'm very excited to speak with you today. Um, we were supposed to do this in person, but you know, best laid plan. So I'm happy to do this on Skype. Are you in um, Nashville right now? I'm actually in Florida. Uh, oh. Yeah, we have a beach house down here that we we brought the kids down uh, a week before their spring break, and it was before everything sort of hit. So we've been here six weeks, and it's it's actually been a great place to be quarantined. I imagine so. So. Um, June is going to be a big month. It's Pride Month, so I want to ask a lot of questions about that. But it's also the month of Songland, uh, its finale. And so I think the kickoff, that one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you for Pride Month was you had a quote on season one of Songland that I thought was hilarious. You said uh, that you'd wanted to be George Strait, yeah. but your name's not George and you ain't straight. It was a good line that should be on a T-shirt. So um, I thought it was really funny. Um, so I guess probably the starting off point is, you know, obviously being uh, LGBTQ in the country world, it's a different world than it used to be, but it's it's still a tough world. And I can maybe count on two hands the amount of mainstream openly gay singers who are very successful, who are like household names. So I kind of want to discuss your journey, but I want to go all the way back to the beginning because before you were on Songland, I just found out that you were on Star Search. Yeah. You were on Star Search. I loved Star Search. Please tell me all about it. I looked on YouTube and I couldn't find your performance. Oh, thank God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I um, So I was 15. I think I was on the 91, 92 uh, season. And I um, I didn't win my episode. I uh, It took me, you know, a year to get on the show and sort of did all the things that I'm sure they have to do now uh, to, for, to get on The Voice and all these other shows. I submitted a tape, and then I went to an audition in Dallas, and then uh, I actually was living in Branson, Missouri at the time doing a show as a teenager. Oh, wow. And I had moved from Texas to Branson for a while. And uh, so while I was doing that show, which was like a seven-day-a-week sort of uh, Opry-style show, uh, I went and filmed the episode of Star Search, which honestly, I even all these years later, which it's been 30 years, okay. I um I just recently sort of have been able to have some fun with the idea of that because I um I come from a small town in Texas and I was struggling with my sexuality, not even knowing that's what I was going through. I uh, was in a very religious community and trying to pray away these feelings I was having. I also, uh, my, my dad had gone to prison a couple years before. We just had kind of a lot of stuff happening. And when I, wow. when I got on Star Search, I kind of saw it as a way out in, in all ways. I just thought, if, if this works out for me, I can help my family, I can help my mother, I can get out of this town that I feel like a misfit in, which ultimately I've come to completely love my hometown and the support I have from them. But at the time I felt, you know, very anxious. And um, so when I went out to California to, to tape Star Search, they put us in West Hollywood and I didn't really put these dots together until I lived there years later. But I remember for the first time, you know, like going to eat with my mom and we were walking down the street and saw two men holding hands. And, you know, that, that was so foreign and, and really exhilarating and, and terrifying to me because I was so interested in it, but so terrified because that was such a sin. And the idea of two men, you know, engaging in any sort of interaction physically like that. So I had a lot of, uh, I don't know how to say it. It's just uncomfortable feelings about the entire thing of Star Search because uh -huh. of the time and because of the fact that I lost and uh, it just felt like a failure. And then I went back to Texas and after the brands and thing and moved back to Texas. And it's just sort of like this thing I wanted to forget about because everybody was so excited about it. And everyone was like, you're going to be on star search. And these expectations of, did you win? Did you lose? Which you're not allowed to say. And then everyone watches it and sees you lose. And then everyone's like, Oh, you did awesome. Which feels patronizing. 
Um, <laughs> it's still something I struggle with uh, when people say, oh, you should have won in any regard. That triggers me. It's so, it sounds so crazy, but it's a conversation I still have with my therapist. Um, oh, wow. I'm sorry I brought up. I didn't mean to no, like bring, I just. Well, it's not, it wasn't, it, it's just this idea that I, it's not just star search. It's in every way, but, but it, it, it's a great, it's a great conversation because I think that people need to hear that, that, um, and I, and I need to hear it because it was a win in that it was a step forward. It was part of my career. It was something, it was really big deal for someone in a small town like that to have that opportunity. But I couldn't see it for anything other than what didn't happen. And mm -hmm. so it for a long time, that was how I looked at it. And then a few years ago, they did, the Country Music Hall of Fame did a, a series called Poets and Prophets. And, and they did sort of a this is your life kind of thing for me. And they wanted to use the Star Search clip. I had never seen it. Uh, I just... I had kind of just put that away. And so at first I said, no, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't feel comfortable watching it. And then, you know, my husband and I talked about it and he was like, this is just something that people would love to see the transition, just that you were young. And so we did use it in, in the um, presentation. And I really was able to sort of, you know, the guy asked me like, what would you say to that kid? I just had so many of my hopes and dreams pinned on that performance. And mm -hmm. I said, I just wish I could tell him right before he walks out, it's okay. Like, this is okay. And it is, you know? So in saying that, I didn't mean it to- No, I no, no, no. Sound so dramatic. <laughs> the, it, it was, it's funny how something seemingly like a blip in your history can repeat. And it's repeated for me many times until it doesn't. And uh, and now it doesn't. and and. I just, I just, it w there was a an ongoing thing. If something was a close call, or if you know, if someone's like patting me on the back, going, "You'll get them next time." Mm -hmm. I, was, I was 15 again, going. Wow. <laughs> really well, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know you're in good company because the following people did not win Star Search. Okay. Destiny's Child, they lost. They were called something else, and they were called Girls Time. But Destiny's Child lost. Justin Timberlake lost. Christina Aguilera was on Britney. I mean, Alanis Law, like so many people were on it. It's more than people. There are more people that came out of Star Search that became famous than American Idol or The Voice and that who did not win. So, right. you know, you're in very esteemed A-list company. So there's no need to feel I bad. I really like that list. I got to look that up because it is fun to be on that list. And it is it's a funny thing that we all have in common because that was our generation's American Idol. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, kids don't know what star search is but the fact that we had something like that is pretty funny absolutely so you mentioned what you were talking about growing up in in the small town and and um not at the moment even realizing what you were grappling with or coming to terms with you didn't really have the definition of what you were going for when did you start to realize i'm gay or i might be gay or or even have an idea of what that is what that meant like yeah. how what was that process well, I certainly didn't know what it meant because I just, I, I didn't know any gay people. I mean, I, I'd never, I don't even remember references for, you know, if there was an, you think about some of the things, well, in Little Richard's passing, I was watching some old interviews and thinking, what did people think that, what, what did people think when he would show up wearing a full face of makeup or acting effeminate or, you know, it was just not, people just did not want to think of that. Mm -hmm. And Elton John, I mean, that was, people just did not want to think of that. And so I was in a family that did the same. It just wasn't a topic. And um, I, you know, as I hit puberty and I start having thoughts, feelings, a physical reaction, and it's to boys as opposed to girls, I was scared to death. I thought... I secretly thought maybe everyone felt that way and that it was something that just changed. And so what mm. would happen is, and I, and I went to a, a Pentecostal church where they would talk about if you, if you have feelings that aren't godlike, or, you know, if something seems like it, it isn't something God would approve of, uh, then you can pray and come to the altar and, 
you didn't have to publicly say what it was, but whatever feelings you were having. So, you know, I, I was on the search. So definitely religion. Um, and I went through years of rebelling against that because it, it, there were a lot of scars. There's a lot of good that come, come out of those things and those spiritual experiences. And I wish that someone had shown me that, that you forge your own relationship with a higher power if that's what you choose to do. And that it is all to better your life, to encourage you, to lift you up, and not to judge or to ultimately, you know, hurt you. Uh, but what I was doing was going to church and going to the altar every time they had an altar call and praying about it. And um, Like praying yeah. to not be gay or praying for the feelings no, to go away? or Praying not to be gay because I think that, that word was in my head was too scary to even consider mm. praying that I would be attracted to female that I would that I could you know be right in God's eyes th that for what and you know that the other thing that is so interesting about that sort of prayer is it comes back later in another form when I had been doing music for well I started professionally when I was 12 traveling in bands and things started recording my own songs around the age of 14 15 and uh I, I hadn't had anything at work for me until I was 34 so over 20 years of working at it and my new prayer became God why would you give me this passion give me something else because I just was so obsessed with music that it was it couldn't have been his plan to give me this gift and this drive and this ambition, but then to not let it work out for me. This all sounds so uh, small minded, I know, but that was just the ignorance of where I came from and, and thinking that there must be some test involved here. And um, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't believe that of course now, but, but it, you know, it took a long time. So when you started, uh, obviously you started when you were 12, as you said, but you got a record deal in uh, 99. So I'm not sure how old you would have been then in your early 20s or so. When I was 19. So I was, and that was in 94. And then my, my first record came out when I was in 99. But I got a record deal pretty quick after I got to Nashville. It just took a few years for the record to come out. So at that point, you're in Nashville, you have a record deal, you're working on a record. How were these fears you had, particularly in light of what I just said about how, especially back then, there weren't too many yeah. openly gay people in country, uh, but back then it was, there were none pretty much. Um, yeah. What were your concerns about keeping that in the closet? Or I don't know if that's the right term, but like keep, you know, not being open about it, things. Well, you know, surprisingly, even after moving to Nashville, I still wasn't, I'd, I'd never been in a relationship with a man or even kissed a boy. I mean, I was with girls just because that was what I had learned and thought, I don't know if I thought I could fall in love hard enough that I could change that. And I um, did meet someone. I went to the University of Texas for two semesters and I met a girl there who is still one of my closest friends and we dated and ultimately she moved to Nashville with me. And, uh, during the process of her being in Nashville and me getting this record deal, it started to, you know, really creep up. Like I'm 24 years old at this point and I'm really feeling the struggle of my sexuality. And I came out to her and we were so embedded in this world of fear that that would keep me from having this country music dream. And she was such a true hearted person and wanted my dream as bad as I did that then she became my beard. I mean, I hate that. Word. But <laughs> I went on the road and she toured with me as wow. Yeah. And she's just a deer. And, and, you know, that was all we knew to do because we knew that anything else wouldn't work. And around that time to even confirm our fears, uh, Ty Herndon, uh, who was having a lot of hits had, had had a, you know, a situation where he had been outed and he was even married to a woman and, and it really hurt his career. And so if anything, and that was right around the time that my record came out. So it's certainly if, if I had even 
had a toe outside of the closet, I got it pushed right back in because I was so afraid of, of what it would mean to my career. So is that why you eventually decided to work behind the scenes where you've had obviously crazy success? Because did you feel that was maybe safer because your face wasn't out there, your name wasn't out there to the general public? It was more an industry thing. Like what was that a factor in going behind the scenes as a songwriter? You know, I don't know, because the truth is, I think I would have I wanted to be an artist so bad and I wanted to make records of my own so bad that it never even seemed like a possibility that I would be out. It wasn't, I was just so dead set on having an artist career. I don't know if I even thought about what it would mean to come out. So it wasn't like I thought, oh, I'll go behind the scenes so I can be out. What ultimately happened was uh, my record deal fell apart in Nashville for other reasons. The music just didn't connect. And uh, I moved to Los Angeles and there I was back in West Hollywood where I had been a decade before sort of seeing all of this happen around me. And I felt protected because nobody out there, first of all, I hadn't had enough of a career for people to know me. And uh, so I just sort of started living as an out man in West Hollywood. And all right. Yeah, and so that I live in West Hollywood. I'm I'm just skyping you from West Hollywood as we speak, so I know exactly what you mean. Where are you? I'm basically at Melrose and Fairfax. Oh, okay, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I lived all around there in the eight mm -hmm. years I was there, and um, so and I worked at Mickey's. <gasps> you worked at Mickey's? Yeah. <laughs> Did they have the drag shows then there? You know, they started to. Uh, that was sort of the later part of me. My ring light just fell. <laughs> Don't and worry. it's not even on. <laughs> it's Sorry. fine. Um, anyway, I love all this technology. So, mm -hmm. the, um, yeah, they started doing those drag shows towards the end of when I worked there. But, but uh, the that whole the years I spent there, I was still doing music, but I was just doing singer songwriter shows. I would play acoustically, like at Hotel Cafe, Cat Club, and I wasn't walking up on stage and saying. I'm here, I'm queer. It wasn't anything like that, but the crowd knew and I could make jokes and sort of have this, you know, underlying uh, rapport. It, it was good. And, and what happened in my career was that I did that for almost eight years and I had a pretty good following. You know, I would sell two or 300 tickets every couple of weeks. It was pretty good. But the thing was, it never changed. It, no one ever walked in that said, I want to sign you. No one ever, it just, it was weird. It was like, I used to say, I don't know what I did for eight years. Now I realized that writing all those songs by myself, the cathartic sort of journey of coming out was all something that had to happen so that when I went back to Nashville, I knew who I was and that really changed everything for me because, you know, then I met someone that refused to be out I mean, to be in, sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> right, didn't right. Have option anymore. It was like, if we're going to live this life in Nashville, then we're going to be out and proud. And, you know, hopefully somewhere along the way, somebody saw that and didn't have to do the parts that were so difficult for me, I hope. So you're referring to your husband. Your husband is sort of the one that was like, if we're going to do this, it's going to be out in the open, like any relationship. It's not going to be a secret relationship you're not going to have a beard all right. that so how did you meet him well i was still living in los angeles and he lived in atlanta at the time and we met in palm springs on uh, just a weekend with friends and um you know i thought it was just going to be a weekend one night kind of thing and mm -hmm. then we started talking on the phone and i was working as a courier in la at this time I had every job as we all did, all creative people. And I was driving around, uh, taking things to studios and stuff. And I was in the car all the time. And I still don't know how he maintained his job in Atlanta because we were on the phone all day. <laughs> and we just, it was a really cool way to get to know someone. But in getting to know him and somebody that just had never lived in the closet, he mm. just didn't, it didn't even make sense to him. It didn't make sense that I still had fear talking to my mom about me being gay, uh, that my hometown 
still didn't really know. Uh, and I still had a lot of ties to my hometown. It just didn't, he wasn't uh, dismissive or, or not empathetic about it. It was just so foreign to him. Right. He was not in a world where, you know, and Atlanta's a, a, a pretty uh, liberal town. And he just lived in a world where everyone around him knew and his family knew. And when we got, I started the, the trek back to Nashville because I'd gotten some songs sort of started to be recorded and I was looking for any way. I mean, I had lost my house in LA actually in the 2008, like big crunch. Um, oh, wow. I had a place in West Hollywood actually, right across the street from Merrick's. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, I had bought a place in there and the the crash happened and my interest rates went through the roof and I couldn't afford it. So I was 33 years old, lost my house, every dime I had put into it, years of savings, something my grandmother had left me also. Um, and then I was just looking for any light. And the, a song that I had written was on hold by Leanne Womack. And that was enough to send me back to Nashville. I mean, it was like, I'll just go where anything is happening. And that was closer to Michael. He was in Atlanta. And so when I got back to Nashville, those first few months, I was living on my sister's couch. And I was still having that problem of writing with people I used to know and using the wrong pronoun. Mm. Or, I mean, even after all this, and I was just, I didn't know what Nashville would think. And He was just the one who was like, this will never work. Not just for us, it won't work for you because you're not, you know, you're creating something that comes from an inauthentic place if you have to go in as anything less than yourself. I didn't understand that until I was on the other side of it, just how big that was. Because when you are trying to create something that you hope connects with people, you gotta be telling the truth. That's Mm -hmm. not level. You know, if you're not being yourself, it's going to it's going to come through. And so that was a big shift for me. And, you know, retroactively, I always joke that I was I had been doing it for, you know, over 20 years at that point. But then things started to happen really, really fast. Well, I'm wondering, I mean, I, I feel you sort of answered it a little bit, this question, by saying that being authentic was what worked for you. But given that I mentioned that even though things are changing now, the country music genre industry has been less, has been slower Mm -hmm. to accept gay artists uh, as compared to say like pop, obviously would, you know, there are tons or even rock. Like, did you ever think like, perhaps I should not go into country. Perhaps I should be, you know, just be a pop, a straight up pop artist, like a, a George Michael or a Sam Smith or a, you know. Absolutely. And that those years spent in L.A., that's what I really chased, mm. uh, you know, playing those shows and things. I wasn't doing country. What's funny is that when you've been in the country world at all, you go to do something in L.A. or New York. And even if you're doing what you consider completely pop or completely left, everyone else thinks it's country. So yeah. in L.A., I was playing things that never would have would have flown in Nashville, but everyone in LA would be like, oh, I love country music. And I'd be like, this isn't country. But <laughs> I was so Southern. And um, yeah, so I certainly considered that and 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 it just never happened. Uh, you know, it just wasn't, it just wasn't on the, I, I can't explain it. I, I felt like I was doing everything to make those things line up and uh, it just didn't work out, you know? Did- did it feel inauthentic to you? Like, this is not the music you really wanted to make? This isn't me sort of vibe? Well, no. I mean, the thing was, so much of that sound I brought back to Nashville. And so many of the have would be influenced by what I did in what I did in Los Angeles. I, I felt like it was sort of a California country, mm. you know, almost what Jackson Brown and Graham Parsons and some of these people did before uh, Amy Lou Harris. You know, I didn't really even know. The Eagles were like my biggest influence always. So the Eagles now would be country. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I, I don't think I felt like it was, it was um, modifying what was natural to me. It was just waiting for the trend to sort of circle back. I, I didn't know that, but you know, it is, that's a big part of being a successful songwriter. If you, are writing what's natural to you, but you're not in the sound of what's commercially viable. 
you know, that I would think timing at times can really not work out for you. What happened was ultimately I feel like what I was doing lined up with the trend. Hopefully I was part of that, but it also had to shift, you know. It was probably a little bit of both, but I'm, right. I'm curious. So you, so you, you know, you've had this crazy journey personally and professionally. You go back to Nashville and then everything starts to click uh, pretty fast. What was the reaction within the industry? It seems like it, it within Nashville, that is. It seems like it was pretty positive or pretty like just people shrugging and not caring, which is how it should be. But did you experience any, the things that you were fearing that you wouldn't be accepted or that people wouldn't want to work to you? Were there any things like that that actually happened? No, none. It was all, if any of that happened, I've said this before, if that happened, it didn't, it never happened in front of me. I never felt on the outside of anything once I was out. It's so funny. It seems the opposite, you know. Uh, I went outside and <laughs> everyone let me in. But the, you know, the the true sort of biggest idea of what the good old boys club is in Nashville, the leader of that is Luke Bryan. That's somebody that he's he sort of represents our industry from that from that point of view. And he was one of the first people who invited me to go on the road and write songs. And I actually said to uh, the person who set it up, I was like, I just want to be sure that, does Luke know that I'm gay? And they said, I, I don't know. Would you like me to ask him? And I was like, I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't want that like, to be a surprise. <laughs> and it just didn't mean anything. It was just like, yeah. oh, yeah, I, I guess I knew that. I mean, it just wasn't a conversation. I, I realized how long I had been holding on to that. But everyone else had gotten past it. And and also, you know, I was writing really good songs. And I think what happened was, and I've said this to people when they come up and they say, what's your advice for a gay songwriter? I'm like, for any songwriter, if you're looking for a commercial career, you just got to be better. I mean, you <laughs> have to just, meaning, if that means outwork, if that means out, I, I don't know what. I just know that at the time, my stuff competitively in what was happening in music. I'm not saying I was a better songwriter. I was saying that the songs I was putting out and putting into the system basically were just a little ahead of the game. And and so I think the sexuality thing just took a back seat. Well, this reminds me of something. I have a feeling you might know who this is. Do you know who Trixie Mattel is? Of course. From, of course you know. So I adore Trixie. I've interviewed Trixie multiple times. Trix write for Trixie, please. Oh my uh, God. You know it's funny because Trixie um often um, will tweet Casey Musgraves, who I work mm -hmm. a lot with. Right. And so we have this sort of ongoing uh, infatuation with her. And I, yeah, I love Drag Race. Yes, I love, I love Trixie. Oh yeah, I actually think at the Billboard Pride Summit, you weren't on the same panel, but you were there the same day. Um, the one okay. that happened last year. I saw them. Yes, because they I, had a drag panel. So like, I mean, my husband too. We That's like, royalty to us seeing them in person. I mean, we, we don't even talk to them. We're so enamored. I think you might have been in the, I know it. there was at one point in the room I saw Trixie talking to Justin Tranter, who was on your panel. And I was like mentally willing, like right together, right together. But you guys together would be even bigger and better of a match. And the reason why I bring her up is I was talking to her because, you know, she, uh, you know, is kind of an Americana artist and she has a lot of country influences. And I was asking her if she really realistically thought that she could be uh, accepted in the country world, like play stagecoach or whatever. And she said, you know, country music fans are more open-minded than people assume. Like there's a stereotype that'd be that I don't like, you know, gay people. Or I don't like drag queens or whatever. But her experience was that you know, of course, there are people who are going to be like that, but that actually, that world is a lot more open-minded than people are giving it credit for. Do you have uh, thoughts about that? I totally agree, and I think that it's a it is a stereotype put upon, but it's also a stereotype that that um, the, the country music audience sometimes allows because uh, so many people are closeted. But country music audience loves. I mean, sorry. Gay people love country music. I mean, this is, you look at, at some of the biggest gay icons and representation for being yourself. Dolly, I was going to say Dolly before you stood up. I was going to go, 
you know, who has been a better advocate or uh, ambassador without even meaning to, because she was herself. Mm -hmm. And, and so you even look at Elton John is beloved by country music fans because again, his music now would be country. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we have an audience that has no real problem with that, but we also have an audience that believes in gender roles. Like if you, you have to be, uh, a man is masculine, a woman is feminine. That is where I think the, the, the problem, if it's a problem, it, it is a problem, but you know, that's where it's not about the gay and straight as much as it is about the blurred lines of gender, because I do feel like there's this black and white when it comes to the audience that loves country music, that it's this or it's this. I mean, it, it's the same conversation we have all the time about, is this country or isn't it? That, mm -hmm. that conversation is, it's an exhausting topic for, for those of us who create because we're, you know, you, you get, you get um, in trouble or, you know, people say, oh, that's not country because you work with Sam Hunt. You don't love country music. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Hunt is one of the most Southern, uh, most country people I know. And he knows more about traditional country music than just about anyone. So it's just these conversations of like the this and that. And I think that's where the stereotype comes from that, that the country audience wouldn't be accepting of, of gays is that they might be a little more, I mean, I'm, I'm actually, I love hearing Trixie say that she doesn't feel as, uh, as out because I would think being a drag queen would be harder. I, I know it would be harder. I'm not, there's no question <laughs> about that. But again, you have Dolly who's always sort of lifted up this drag community and almost, mm -hmm. lived, you know, by her own words as a drag queen. Mm -hmm. It's like she makes it okay. So, well, in terms of the blurred lines, both of gender and sexuality, but also of genre, do you think that's changing? Because there's two examples I can think of that tick all those boxes in the last year or so. And one is the really obvious one, which is Lil Nas X, mm -hmm. where who created, you know, uproarious debates about where he fits in as a genre. And also, you know, at the height of his success came out actually almost a year ago, it was the end of Pride Month last year, but also Orville Peck, who I imagine you're familiar with, uh -huh. um, who is, you know, uh, gay, but also very theatrical, wears like the mask and has, you know, and those are two artists that it got canceled or postponed, unfortunately, but those are two artists that were supposed to play both Coachella and Stagecoach back to back weekends. So like, do you feel like the stuff you're talking about, about people wanting to stay within a rigid line is changing. It's it's funny because both of those. First of all, Lil Nas, as as the as the um, controversy grew over Old Town Road, I didn't know that he was gay for yeah. six months. Mm -hmm. it, that was not the controversy in our world. The controversy was: Is he a rap artist trying to do country? Is he country? I question. I never got a question about him being gay. That was like what followed. Uh, and I think with Orville, who I'm not as familiar with, these are both artists that outside of mainstream country, everyone sees them as country artists. Casey Musgraves is like this. But when you're in the, the sort of country world that's on the radio, that, that Music Row represented, those artists aren't considered country. They're, mm -hmm. It's more like a... What would you even call it? I mean, obviously the music has roots in a Southern world, but it's also about image. You know, Casey is not considered, uh, I mean, she's considered country and, and loved by Nashville, but she's mostly beloved by the creators. When it comes to the the button pushers at radio or people that, that make those choices, she's so far outside. And a lot of people don't know that because she's so popular. And so I feel like those two artists you named are sort of in that world, where outside of country, everyone's all, all like, oh, look at these people changing the stereotypes of country. I think I'd like to see what would happen if somebody made a, a, a country music record that is commercial by today's standards, that 
is a little safer in that regard. And then the person who's having hits, like Luke Holmes or somebody, say, mm -hmm. oh, and by the way, I'm gay. That would be a really interesting, and, and it'll happen. I mean, there's it'll no, happen. There's no way it won't. But, but that will be the true, I think, telling of where we're at. <laughs> it's curious to me. It's interesting to me about the image thing because, you know, we talked about how Dolly kind of looks like a drag you know, drag queen herself. Casey, you know, is very glamorous. Uh, Trixie is a drag queen. Lil Nas X and Orville are, you know, have are very styled. But like, look at the classic. Like, look at go to like the Country Museum in Nashville. Look at rhinestone cowboy. It's all nudie suits and rhinestones, and it's like it's not jeans and a t-shirt by any means. So like, why did we get away from that sort of theatricality in presentation? Which no matter what gender or sexuality you are it's just fun i know i'm with you and i don't i don't know when that changed and i feel like i feel like bands like midland uh can start to shift those things back casey's a great example or at least to have room for that uh because that certainly didn't mean gay or straight before yeah. and um we do have great allies i mean midland is a band that i work a lot with and mm -hmm. those guys are straight but they have very little uh, regard for whether or not, you know, gay, straight, that just doesn't matter to them. And, um, there's never even a conversation. So, uh, I mean, there's a conversation in jokes and things like that with, you know, we're all together because, uh, I always joke that if I met them and, you know, before my husband, I would just, I would have just married Midland. Um, oh yeah. They're, they're, they're hot. That's a thruple right there. They're all very looking. And very stylish as well. What do you think of the whole, like, um, I don't know, for lack of a term, other, you've mentioned some artists that people would categorize as bro country, Sam Hart and Luke Bryan. Right. And those lyrics are often about, you know, very, like, dude things, very bro things, you know, girls. Totally. Girls, girls drinking. And girls, yes. Pretty much. And you write for those people. Yeah. Like, and so, like, when you're writing for them, do you have to put yourself in, like, a different, you know, mindset or you know I, I no i think that we can now meet at a, at a you know a common ground where it's, if i'm talking about a relationship or if i'm talking about you know the trials of that that i can say well you know with my husband we have this situation and and they're like oh yeah it's the same with my wife or in my marriage so i think that that is what changed for me because when I was able to have that sort of conversation and, and I, I also think that a lot of them, it's, it's been a thing of like, wow. I mean, it's exactly the same. I mean, we're chasing kids around. You saw when we started this thing, I was just trying to get my damn dog out of the, <laughs> out the <laughs> from digging a hole and my kids are running around because he chases them all the time. And those are things that I, I didn't know that you could have, that life and not that that's what every gay person wants mm -hmm. but i wanted that and for a lot of years i lived in fear that i wouldn't have that and so uh you know uh, this this sort of domestic uh chaos uh tells me one that it's not all it's cracked up to be <laughs> <laughs> i know well nothing is uh, but, but i am i am curious because you are known for your storytelling lyrics you know um not to play favorites. You're my favorite judge on uh, Songland for that reason. You really get right. into that. You understand that. And you, in your, in the work you, in your own work outside of Songland, you're very into like these unrequited love songs. It's kind of yes. like the thing. I'm curious if what you went through before you were out, maybe pining for someone and not being able to tell them, um, or even understand it, uh, is that something you draw from when you're writing? You know, it, it is something that I draw from. I don't have a person in the past that I could think that I was secretly pining for that didn't love me back. Uh, unless it goes back to childhood and, you know, wanting my dad's attention. Mm. And um, I think that a lot of people can trace back to their parents and uh, and my dad, we we have worked things out, and I love my dad. It's it's just that I think I wanted to be whatever he wanted of me, and so 
that's the only thing I, I have thought about the unrequited love thing because it does show up in so many of my songs and my stories and and it always is what I'm drawn to in other songs mm -hmm. and uh, I always reference my favorite song is you don't know me it's an old you know if you give your hand to me and then you say hello and I can hardly speak um, my heart is beating so you'll never never know the one who loves you so because you don't know me mm -hmm. and that just, even saying those words to you now, I get chills. I don't know what it is about that. I've honestly always had, I've always been lucky that if I fell for someone or liked someone, I feel like they've loved me back. Um, so it's funny that I've, that that is what I chase. Uh, that that feeling of not being loved is, is really alluring to me. <laughs> you know, writing songs. I have an empathetic heart for the lonely, I, um, especially in this time of us all being quarantined, I, I just think so often about what it would be like to be alone right now. And uh, so I write a lot of songs about that, even though I'm not alone. A couple songs I want to specifically ask. We talked a lot about Casey. A lot of people um, definitely keep your name and her name together in their minds because you've had such success together. And also... Um, you know, she's an ally and she, you know, Rainbow is the obvious one, but Follow Your Arrow, which had a specific line about if you want to kiss girls, go ahead. And then Rainbow kind of became an anthem, whether that was intentional or not, I don't know. But can you tell me a little bit about like the special relationship that you have working with her and doing songs like that, that have crossed over? Yeah, well, first of all, Casey, she grew up in a small town in Texas too, but she grew up 15 years after I did. And she just never, you know, it's funny because I think even if she was here, when we talk about her being an ally, it just was, it wasn't a conscious decision. She never had a thought any other way. And when I met her, she just, she was such a refreshing sort of like, as she was Dolly, she was, Leanne Womack, she was Loretta. She was everyone that I loved, Willie Nelson, and, and it were like wrapped up in one, but yet she was so young because my thought was, how were those your influences? Those were my influences. And um, she just had this knowledge of music. She, she was raised by parents that saw the world very openly. Uh, and so when we wrote Follow Your Arrow, that was not intentional what happened with that song, it wasn't, we were not writing a, an anthem for gay people. It just happened to be she was in the room with two gay people when we were writing it, Brandy Clark and myself. But we thought it was funny to say, or kiss lots of girls if that's what you're into. <laughs> that made us laugh. And, um, and she was so dead set on putting that on the record. We had actually already finished same trailer, different park. She already had a song on the radio, Merry Go Round. And, um, so when we wrote that, she was like, we have to go back in and cut this. It has to be on my record. I always thought we were writing for the next record. And she was like, no, I can't put my first record out without this on it because I just don't want to wait. I want this to be a part of it. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a real shock to us when she played it for the label and they said, no. One, we're not going to put it on the record because your record is done. Second of all, she wanted it to be the first song on the record. And they said, you can't start... A record with that song and third of all it will it will never be a single so the compromise was if I go in and cut it and use the remaining budget I have and it doesn't cost anything can I add it to the record if I put it at the end of the record and then we can just not worry about it being a single then what happened was they they let that happen and uh and then as she started playing shows and the song started getting out there, her, her crowd started sort of demanding it. And when it came time for the third single, uh, she said, I can't put out another song without putting that out. I will look like a coward. We didn't even know it was gonna be controversial until the label had said, no, you can't, you can't do it. You can't put it first on a record. And that was when we were like, wait, what? Like, what is it even saying? It's saying, be yourself. And so we actually felt kind of proud of ourselves that it hit that many buttons because it was completely 
the funnest song to write. We were just having a blast. Like, oh, let's say if you if you go to church, if you don't go to church, you'll go to hell. But if you sit in the front row, everybody's going to dog you for being too pious, you know? So, <laughs> so we just thought that was all funny. And, you know, what happened was it, she did sort of force the hand of it being a single and it didn't even go top 40 at country radio, uh, which, you know, didn't have the support of the label. And so the little song that could went on to be the CMA song of the year and, and has obviously meant way more to her career than songs that did go on to be radio hits. That's uh, an amazing story. I yeah. It was that. The lowest charting song to ever be nominated for song of the year. So we were shocked when it got nominated <laughs> and then to win. I mean, I'm sure in retrospect now with all the years of people knowing that song, it seems like, oh, of course, that was song of the year. We could have been knocked over with a feather. When they <laughs> said it at night, we were just like, this has to be a mistake. And Casey's acceptance speech was, do you have any idea what this means for country music? And wow. it really was telling that the community was saying, we want people to be who they are. And uh, it doesn't really matter if, if the powers that be don't believe it, you know? So that song really was of its own, you know, it, it did it itself. And the people that love her kept pushing it to the front. So it's a, it's a gift. Rainbow's not that different, even though it's been years later that we wrote Rainbow right around the same time that we wrote Follow Your Arrow. And we wrote it just as a little song. It didn't have, again, we weren't writing a gay anthem. And I'm not just saying that. I'm not trying to make light of it. Casey just didn't do that. And the reason she didn't write gay anthems, because to her, an anthem is an anthem. She didn't think of songs like, I'm writing this for gay people. Mm -hmm. She was going, she loved rainbows. And she's, she always has a theme, if you've noticed, um, whether it's unicorns or, you know. And she was just like, I want to write a song called Rainbow. She loved Rainbow Connection. That's one of her favorite songs growing up. She used to sing it. And so her and Natalie and I wrote, Natalie Hemby and I wrote this song called Rainbow. It didn't make the second record. And then it just sat there for five years. And I never thought, ever, ever, ever thought that song would come back into play. And because um, we've written so many songs since. Mm -hmm. And um, the next thing you know, she decides to put it on Golden Hour. And then the next thing you know, Golden Hour becomes the you know biggest record of the year and they never released any singles from golden hour there were never songs sent to radio so when they released the album they put out butterflies and space cowboy just to let people know the album was coming and country radio is so far from her that they didn't even attempt it they thought it would just be a waste of energy and money so the record comes out builds interest builds interest sweeps the grammys and then she sings rainbow on the grammys and there was it just became so popular that they decided to put it out as a single it only went to 33 on country radio but it just has gone on that song I, you know i'm just so grateful that i was in the room that day and that all these years later the song has so much more relevance to me it it uh it's definitely the most important song i've been a part of and it has it has its piece in my own soundtrack and we lost someone uh, very close to us at the end of last year and it became our family's anthem and hers as she uh as she got sicker and so now we see her in rainbows that was what she told our kids before she passed and oh, wow. we see rainbows everywhere and now with corona i mean and people feeling like it's a, some sort of ray of hope this is just things we could have never foreseen and, and never known that it waiting those five years to be recorded, that the timing was perfect. Wow. Um, do you think the stuff that you're working on now with other artists is going to be affected by what's going on in the world right now? Like, are you looking to write more hopeful songs or like what, how, how is that informing what you're writing about right now? Well, it's funny. It can, it can sometimes show up in a, in a serious way. And then sometimes, like, I just wrote this song called Homebody, and the, the hook is, you got the kind of body that makes me want to be a homebody. Very country <laughs> idea, but it was influenced by, look, we're all turning into homebodies here. <laughs> yep. It can show up like that. 
are certainly songs of hope. I, you know, I, I used to not consider myself somebody that would write songs. Because, you know, we talked about the unrequited love thing. I've always loved a broken heart. So the idea of it getting better uh, <laughs> has not ever appealed to me as a writer. <laughs> the last few months. Because, gosh, we need some hope. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Cer it's certainly influencing the way I write, when I do write, this is a really tough way to write. I, I, some, mm -hmm. people, some people do the Zoom thing or the Skype thing really well. I need to be in the room with somebody. I, you know, it's just, I need that. Even if you're not physically touching, I need to feel like I could. You know, we just are, um, it's an intimate thing to write songs. And, yeah. and so uh, I, I really miss I really miss that. It's hard to stay focused on a screen. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, obviously, you know, Songland shows that so well, shows you sitting there with a contestant and kind of gives a peek that a lot of people don't know into that. And, you know, I know sometimes, you, you know, you get on the phone and like talk to the artist or whatever, but for the most part, you're like right there in the room. So I imagine that would be weird. But I've, yeah. I've won. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, we, and, and I was telling you that I did a little piece for The Voice with some of their contestants and we had to do it via Zoom and we were working on songs. The most exhausting thing I've ever done. I mean, I, it, when it was over, I felt just so drained because you are trying to convey something more because you're not sitting in 3D with them. So you're just, mm -hmm. it's, and, and they feel it too. I mean, it's like, how can I show you? It's also just spatial recognition. So often when you're writing with someone, you're, you're studying their reaction to things to know whether or not it works. It's mm -hmm. hard to tell on a screen, you know? Well, I guess we're all adapting. I've enjoyed talking to you on a screen. It actually has felt like a natural conversation. Sometimes it's a little weird to kind of get used to, especially with all the technical things that can go wrong. But this actually like felt like a real conversation. It was a really great conversation. Thank you so much. I have one last question for you, though. So we talked, we went all the way back to a different reality show. You're on one now, but you were on Star Search. And then you had your, your musical career, your solo career for a while, but then you went into songwriting. But have you completely abandoned the idea of doing, you know, music as a recording artist? Because especially with Songland now, there's a whole new audience, mainstream audience that knows your name and face and personality that didn't know it before, as well as your credits. So, like, it seems like if that was something that was still a dream for you, this would be a good time to consider it. It is. And I am. I am. Um, you know, I feel I feel um, vulnerable to saying that out loud because... I certainly have the voices that everyone has, which is, who do you think you are? Or, yeah, you know, I'm 45 years old. I uh, haven't uh, had success with my voice singing. And so there's there's those demons or, you know, but the thing is, I'm, I'm trying to overcome all those things in my life. So the idea of actually going in and recording something of my own would hopefully show people that that stuff isn't real, that those ideas, but I have to get over it myself. I know that when I say to you, and if I was telling you the same thing, I would say, do it. Like you have to do it. And so I'm learning to hear my own advice, but I am, you know, actually just before we talked, I was working on a song and I was just sitting here thinking, what if I didn't what if I didn't take this to an artist because it feels so personal? What if I didn't say, hey, I've got this idea I want to play for you? What if I just finished it and just put it up? So we'll see if I get brave. Do it. Do it. Do that and write for Trixie Mattel. That's my to-do list that I'm giving you in whatever order feels comfortable for you. But I would love to see both those things happen. And I'm very excited about, uh, I assume, hopefully Songland will be coming back for a season Season three, I was very happy that Songland got renewed for a season two, because I mean this with no shade, but I wondered if that show would connect with an audience because it's not a reality show with a bunch of drama, no one's fighting, you know, it's like just the artistic process and it's really connected. So I'm excited that that is doing well and putting I, your face out there. I really think the timing, I think at a different time it wouldn't have. I think people do want to feel Good. And, and what I love the most, even though this isn't the case at our house, because our kids could not be less impressed with me. But I love when people come up to me and say, it's one of the only shows that like I watch with my six year old and I watch with my mother. And that I never thought about that, that that process would be something that's interesting to all ages. I can't get my kids to sit down for it. They're like, we get it. You're on. Maybe, TV. 
Maybe for season three. Maybe yeah, for season maybe. three. Well, thank you so much. And it's been a wonderful conversation. Stay safe in Florida. And I'm looking forward to the music you make, either for other artists or for yourself in the near future. Really, really appreciated this. I had a blast. I can't believe it's we've talked this long. Thank you. I know. You. I'm glad. I'm, I was like, am I going too long? But it was going well. So yeah, it's not it was, like I had anywhere to go, right? <laughs> me, me too. <laughs>